Dobre vietru, panie i panjovie. Dinkuje za zaprošenje na šeski da Krakova. Bendamovic do Angesku. For, the, thank you. for those who don't speak Polish, and perhaps also for those who do, <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to our hosts for inviting us here to beautiful Krakow. And I'm now going to speak in English. The focus of this conference is on quality, efficiency, and equity in family medicine. Yet the mascot for this conference is a dragon. So during this presentation, I'm going to introduce you to some famous dragons and try to explain what dragons have to do with our work as family doctors. Can you please raise your hand? I can't see you, but can you please raise your hand if you believe in dragons? Are dragons real? Raise your hand. Oh, he was looking for skeptics. Okay. <laughs> if you don't believe in dragons now, I guarantee that by the end of this talk, you will believe that dragons are real. And more than that, I guarantee that by the end of this talk, you will have shaken the hand of a dragon. There are dragons amongst us, as you will soon discover. Indeed, there are the bones of dragons here in Krakow, hanging outside the main door of the cathedral on Wawel Hill, and some of you will have seen them during your touring around. This past week, we have celebrated World Family Doctor Day, the day of the year when we acknowledge the wonderful work that you do as a family doctor, and we say thank you. The theme of this year's World Family Doctor Day is family doctors leading the way to better health. And I want to acknowledge the work of the family doctors of Poland and the other nations of Eastern Europe, family doctors who have been leading the way for the past 25 years to better health for the people of their countries. In 2016, Wonka published a book called Family Medicine, the Classic Papers, edited by our president, Amanda Howe, by Iona Heath from the UK and by myself. We invited 35 leading family doctors from around the world to nominate the most important publication in family medicine over the last 100 years. And one of the contributors to our book was Professor Bohumil Seifert, who is Professor of Family Medicine in Prague in the Czech Republic. Bohumil nominated this paper by Professor Igor Svob from Slovenia and colleagues, describing the revolution that took place in primary care across Eastern Europe following the dramatic changes at the end of the 20th century, including how family medicine has become a very important part of healthcare systems across this region. And in his paper, Igor pays tribute to the pioneers of family medicine in this region, including our conference scientific program chair, Professor Adam Vindak from Poland. Together, Adam and his colleagues have grown and developed family medicine general practice in all its European diversity. We've seen the development of the academic discipline of family medicine. We've seen the recruitment of the next generation of family physicians. We've seen the mutual benefits that come from working together in collaboration. And Wonka Europe has played an essential role in this development providing a platform for learning and for sharing successes and challenges in the development of quali quality clinical care, education and research. We've also seen the development in this region of the Wonka Europe Young Family Doctor Organisation, the Vasco da Gama movement, which over the past two days, as we've heard, has been holding its pre-conference. And I would... I would like to invite the 90 medical students and the 600 young family doctors in the room to stand up. Please, stand up. Thank you 
Shaw. Ladies and gentlemen, the future family doctors of the world. In her seminal work examining healthcare systems in many countries, the great Barbara Starfield provided us with the evidence. The evidence to show that a greater emphasis in a country on primary care and family medicine can be expected to improve health through access to more appropriate services, to lower the cost of health care and to reduce the inequities in a population's health. This is quality, efficiency and equity. Quality, efficiency and equity are three of the features that any well-functioning, people-centred, socially accountable health care system or service should seek to address. This is one of our colleagues, Dr. Thomas Drivsholm, who's a Danish family doctor working in Copenhagen. And here he is in his consulting room, meeting with one of his family health team members. And like Thomas, as family doctors, you and I are committed to providing high quality health care and to ensuring that our services are as efficient and equitable as possible. I'm sure that nobody in this room wakes up in the morning and thinks, how can I deliver a low quality, inefficient, inequitable service to my patients today? We get up and we go to work ready to deliver the best quality care that we can. But how do we know if we're providing good quality healthcare services to our individual patients and our communities? How do we know if our services are meeting the needs of the populations that we serve? And how do we ensure that the most vulnerable and marginalised people in our community are not missing out on health care? Fortunately, we have colleagues who are working hard on ensuring the quality and safety of the care we provide. These are some of our colleagues from across Europe who are part of EQUIP, the European Society for Quality and Safety in Family Medicine, one of the great networks of Wonka Europe. And our colleagues from EQUIP will be hosting a stream of workshops during this conference with a focus on quality improvement, on patient safety, on person-centred healthcare, and I encourage you to join with them. As family doctors, we have a wonderful role. This is one of our colleagues, Dr. Sandra Alexiou. Sandra is from Romania. She's here today with, as you've heard, Romania is the 10th biggest delegation at this conference. Sandra is here today with her 12-year-old son, Rarish, who also wants to be a family doctor. And Sandra is here with one of her former residents, uh, who we've already seen, uh, Raluca, who we've already seen up on the stage uh, earlier this evening. As family doctors like Sandra and Raluca, we strive to deliver the best care we can for our patients, the people who trust us for their medical care and advice. Our work can be challenging. Our work can be arduous. We often feel undervalued, especially by our governments. Sometimes we even get bad press. Dragons know how we feel. Dragons have had a bad press for millennia. Here is a painting by Raphael. It's the Archangel Michael at the very beginning of time subduing sin and evil, depicted in the form of a dragon. Here is the dragon from J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit. His name is Smog. Smog is also the Polish word for dragon. And Smog is a fiercely protective dragon. He is a gatekeeper. He guards the entrance to unimaginable treasures. He also has a fiery temper. J.K. Rowling, in her book Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, describes a variety of brave and proud <coughs> European dragons. The Norwegian Ridgeback, the Hungarian Horntail, the Swedish Shortsnout, 
the common Welsh green, the Hebridean black, a true European parliament of dragons. And like the members of the real European parliament, one thing they all have in common is a thick skin. <laughs> the Game of Thrones depicts the mother of dragons, Daenerys Targaryen, and her three strong and independent offspring, each with special healing powers. A dragon appears on the national flags of two countries. Can you think which are the two countries which have a dragon on their flag? Here is one of them. The flag of Wales with the red dragon. The red dragon was believed to be the flag of the mythical King Arthur and his father, Uther Pendragon. King Arthur and his knights were responsible for a lot of the bad press the dragons have received. They were depicted as being brave and chivalrous, saving innocent damsels in distress from marauding, fearsome dragons. Dragons received terrible bad press in medieval times. It's no wonder dragons became extinct in Europe during the Middle Ages. The next dragon is the most fearsome dragon in the world today. <laughs> this is not a dragon. Or maybe it is. He's certainly very scary. No, this is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is an expert in bad press. He calls it fake news. And he should know, because nobody in recent human history has created as much fake news as Donald Trump and his Twitter account. Now, the English word dragon comes from the Latin word draco. But the real Draco was not a dragon. He was a man. He was a Greek tyrant who ruled Athens in around 620 BCE. And Draco developed the first constitution of Athens, which decreed the death penalty should apply to almost every crime, including, specifically, stealing a cabbage. Draco's application of the law gave us the word draconian, any law which is excessively harsh or severe. Eventually, the good people of Athens had had enough of Draco and his draconian laws, so they exiled him to an island where he spent the rest of his days alone, which was probably a very good thing. Unlike in Europe, dragons are respected in other parts of the world. In China, for example, dragons are the most revered animal in Chinese culture. In the past, the emperors of China were seen as the reincarnation of dragons. The dragon is one of the 12 animals of Chinese astrology. Every 12 years, the Chinese celebrate the year of the dragon. And fortune favours, traditionally, people born in the year of the dragon. They are said to be the luckiest of people. They often become family doctors. Here are the years in which people are in the year of the dragon. And I'd like you to stand up. If you were born in one of these years, please stand up. Please stand up. If you were born in one of these years, here they are. Here they are. Stay standing up. People born in the year of the dragon are said to be smart, energetic, ambitious, passionate, extroverted, often conceited, hot-headed, quick-tempered, and sharp-tongued, unleashing fierce tempers if provoked. I told you there were some dragons amongst us. As well as being the home of dragons, China is undergoing a revolution in family medicine. The government of China has realised that in order to deliver high quality, efficient, equitable health care to the 1.6 billion people living in China, including the 800 million who live in rural areas, 
they need to invest in family medicine. The government of China has decided that over the next seven years, it will train an additional 400,000 family doctors. That's extraordinary. This is one of our colleagues, Dr. Yin Shu Long, who is a rural family doctor working in a small village about two hours north of Beijing. And Dr. Yin lives and works in a traditional Chinese farmhouse. It's four, square, four sides, a courtyard in the middle. In one side is his home, in one side is his clinic, in one side he keeps his equipment, in the other side he keeps his animals. His waiting area is in the courtyard in the middle, where his patients wait to see him among his chickens and his pigs. And he practices traditional Western medicine, but also traditional Chinese medicine, integrating the two forms of healthcare to meet the specific needs of his patient population. But he is also part of a revolution taking part in China because the medical schools in China are now training their medical students out in clinics like this. They rotate out to rural areas. They visit with doctors like Dr. Yin to see how to practice medicine. This is the second nation which has a dragon on its flag. It's the dragon of the kingdom of Bhutan. This is called the Thunder Dragon. Bhutan is a wonderful small country high in the Himalayas. It's very remote. The king of Bhutan is called the Dragon King. The people call themselves the people of the dragon. Bhutan is noticeable because instead of having a gross domestic product, they have a gross domestic happiness index. The king measures the happiness of his people. How's that for an approach to looking after your people? It's a country like nowhere else on earth. I visited Bhutan late last year. I was fortunate to be there during a dragon moon. The full moon was wreathed with clouds. And if you look hard, you can see the dragons in the sky. Bhutan, like many low and middle income countries, faces great challenges in delivering high quality health care to all its people, many living in very remote villages high in the Himalayas. Last year, the young king introduced specialty family doctor training. This training has been developed by our wonderful colleague, Dr. Chubby, and is based on the family doctor training model in Nepal. And it prepares its graduates for practice wherever they are most needed and they're trained with skills in comprehensive family medicine, including emergency medicine, anaesthetics, obstetrics, surgery, and psychiatry. It's a wonderful model developed for the specific needs of that country. Back in Europe, European map makers in the Middle Ages used to mark the areas that had not yet been explored by Europeans with the warning that here be dragons. And my own country, Australia, and our neighbour, Indonesia, were amongst those areas where the map makers said that dragons lived. And they do. Australia is a country which is renowned for being full of animals that try to kill you. It is also the home of three types of real dragons. The leafy sea dragon the most beautiful of dragons, which lives in the seas of the south, related to the seahorse, floating around peacefully in the ocean. Bearded dragons, which live in the central deserts with their spiky beards. And water dragons, little dragons which live around creeks and billabongs and jump out and jump back in to see what's going on. While these are small dragons, Australia is also the home of true monsters, including saltwater crocodiles, which grow up to seven metres in length and which consume at least two to three people every year. People who are unfortunate enough to venture into the rivers and swamps where these crocodiles are waiting. Nearby Indonesia, 
is an archipelago of 17,000 inhabitable islands, which are the home to 200 million people. One of these islands is called Komodo, and on the island of Komodo are the largest lizards in the world, the Komodo dragons. They grow up to three metres in length, and they are not averse to devouring stray cats and dogs and the occasional small child. Indonesia, like many developing nations, is focusing on the challenge of how to deliver high quality, efficient, equitable care to a population of 200 million people. Across Indonesia are a network of community health centres called Puskesmas. Previously, these centres were staffed by community health workers, by dedicated community nurses. But now they are staffed by family doctors, like our colleague here, this young family doctor who moved to her rural community three years ago. The first thing she did was look at what were the healthcare challenges of her, her community. She found there was an unacceptable rate of maternal mortality, of infant mortality. So in her clinic, she established a birthing centre. She trained her nurses to be midwives. She introduced programs for the under fives, immunising all of her children, making sure all her children were well nourished and introducing programs tackling chronic disease. Last year, the Indonesian government launched for the first time its own postgraduate family doctor training program based in 17 universities spread across the country. If a low to middle income country like Indonesia can be tackling the challenge of delivering high quality care in this way, we should all be able to do so as well. This is the wonderful Dr. Margaret Chan. Until recently, Margaret Chan was the Director General of the World Health Organization. I went to a talk by Dr. Chan recently in China and in the audience, there were doctors who were family doctors and doctors from every other specialty. And Dr. Chan stood up and she said, I have a secret to share with you. I love family medicine. And all the family doctors in the audience stood up and cheered. And all the other doctors looked unhappy because she didn't say, I love all the other doctors. She said, I love family medicine. And the reason she loves family medicine is she sees family medicine as being a core part of strengthening primary health care. And strengthening primary health care is the only way we will deliver universal health coverage. Health coverage to all people in all communities, in all countries of the world. The United Nations in 2015 released the new Sustainable Development Goals goals for the next 15 years which the nations of the world including all of your governments have signed up to goals which commit us to ensuring that we eradicate poverty we eradicate extreme hunger we make sure that everybody has access to health care as a fundamental human right and other goals many of which rely on a healthy community a healthy environment a healthy workforce it's very exciting times I was at the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 at the United Nations and they put up these goals for the very first time. And I said to my colleague from the United Nations sitting beside me, who picked the logo for health? That is a very unhealthy cardiograph. If I had a cardiograph like that, I would be lying on the floor. Unfortunately, everything had already been printed, so that's what we're left with. But I wasn't very popular on that day. But this is our commitment, the commitment of our governments to deliver health care to all people. And as Amanda has reminded us, in October, the governments of the world, all our health ministers will come together in Kazakhstan to recommit to the principles of the Declaration of Alma-Ata. Strong primary health care, delivering health care to all people. And we, as Amanda has said, we have to make sure that included in that plan is the contributions of the health workforce. Family doctors, community nurses and midwives, community health workers, allied health professionals, all working together 
to deliver health care to all of our populations. Margaret Chan has told us that what gets measured gets done. It's very important that our countries measure what is happening in family medicine and is able to measure the quality of the service we provide and how we are tackling efficiency and equity. And there are big players who are looking at this. The World Bank has got on board. I know the World Bank was very active 25 years ago in the countries of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet states in supporting the redevelopment of healthcare programs based on strong family medicine, based on strong primary care. But the World Bank has important new partners, especially the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Bill Gates gets it. He understands that the most important investment he can make of his many billions of dollars being donated to healthcare is to strengthen primary health care in all the countries of the world. In fact, these three organisations have got together to deliver a new initiative, the Primary Health Care Performance Initiative, which is supporting low and middle income countries to measure how well they're doing. For the first time, all countries will be reporting on how much of their expenditure on health care is spent on hospitals, how much is spent in the community and then we will be comparing country to country. We will be comparing the healthcare outcomes. We will be comparing where their healthcare workforce ends up working, in the community, in the rural areas, in the urban low-income areas, or in high-income hospitals. It's a very important strategy. In the country that I've recently moved to, Canada, there's a great focus on quality and quality improvement in family medicine. One of the most exciting things I discovered in Canada is that every young doctor in training, in their first year of training to be a specialist family doctor, has to do a quality improvement project. They have to look at the practice where they work, identify an area which needs improvement, and then implement change with the members of their family health teams. We're inculcating the importance of quality right from the very start of people's training. And I know this is happening in many of the countries of Europe as well. So we come to the end of my presentation and I ask you the question again, do you now believe in dragons? Are dragons real? Of course they are, you've seen them up there. I want to recap. Here is what we know about dragons. Dragons are strong and independent. Dragons are brave and proud. Dragons can be the victim of fake news. Bad dragon. Dragons can be fearless and a little scary. Dragons can be wise counsellors. Dragons have to have a thick skin. Dragons are gatekeepers to unimaginable riches. Dragons have special healing powers. And you should not annoy a dragon first thing in the morning because they can breathe fire. This is what we know about dragons. And this is what we know about family doctors. Strong and independent, brave and proud, sometimes victims of fake news, fearless and a little scary, wise counsellors, thick-skinned, gatekeepers to the unimaginable riches of the healthcare systems. We have special healing powers. The last one, yeah, maybe that's pushing things a little bit. However, I have to tell you, I always avoid annoying my practice partner in the morning before she has had her morning coffee, because she can breathe fire. So this is what we know about dragons. Ladies and gentlemen, Family doctors are the dragons of the healthcare system. So please, I would like you to shake the hand of the person on your left and the person on your right. Shake their hand, the person on your left and the person on your right. In so doing, we make a in so doing, you are shaking the hand of a dragon, as I promised.
I wish you well, my brothers and my sisters, the dragons of healthcare. Thank you, thank you for the wonderful work that you do every day for your patients, for the people who trust you for their care and advice. May you remain strong and independent and brave and proud throughout your wonderful careers. Thank you all.